We're obsessed with feeling comfortable. We can't wait to get home from work or school and change into our sweatpants. Ask any teacher and most students what their favorite day of spirit week is, and they'll probably tell you pajama day. We have comfort blankets. We love comfort food. We have comfort pets. Our comfort pets even have comfort pets. We love to feel comfortable, and we love to make other people feel comfortable as well. I'm trying to make you feel comfortable by showing you this picture of my son's puppy, but don't fall for it. It's about to get uncomfortable. You probably heard that there are some topics we shouldn't talk about in public because they make people feel uncomfortable. Topics like sex, religion, money, politics. And I'm going to add race to that list. We don't like to talk about race because it makes us feel uncomfortable. In 2017, a school district in Biloxi, Mississippi banned reading the book To Kill a Mockingbird because they said it made people feel uncomfortable. I could be wrong, but I think that was the point of the book. It's hard to argue with feeling comfortable because we all like to feel comfortable. In fact, I'm uncomfortable right now as a white woman talking about race. I'm afraid of being seen as someone with a white savior complex, and I'm also afraid of offending anyone but it's time to step out of my comfort zone. No growth in the comfort zone, no comfort in the growth zone, and we're about to enter the growth zone. So I'm gonna ask you to start with the premise that we can be good people and be somewhere on the racist continuum as well, because we're socialized this way. We get so many images all the time that tells us that white is better than black, and the more we're aware of it, the more we see it everywhere we go. My daughter is an elementary school teacher in the South Bronx, and Shayla is a black student in her first grade class. Shayla wrote an opinion piece about why Jojo Siwa is the best singer, and when asked for evidence to support her opinion, Shayla wrote, Jojo is amazing and her skin is white. Shayla also said that she wished her skin was white like my daughter's in first grade, and that's uncomfortable. Glenn Singleton, in his book, Courageous Conversations About Race, suggests that protocols need to be put into place when we're about to talk about typical conversations like race. And I'm gonna ask that today you enter into the four agreements of conversation with me. The first agreement is stay engaged. Please try to commit to staying focused, even if you hear things that are uncomfortable or things that you don't agree with. Try not to leave physically or mentally a conversation about race. The second agreement is speak your truth. Commit to being honest and speaking openly about your own relationship with race, even if it doesn't paint the prettiest picture of you. I plan to speak my truth today, and I hope that when I'm finished, you'll be willing to speak yours as well. The next agreement is experience discomfort. So time to get out of those sweatpants and into the tight jeans. Um, I like this one because it lets us know that even though it feels uncomfortable, it's okay, it's acceptable, and even though we might not embrace the discomfort, we can certainly tolerate it. And finally, the, the last agreement is expect and accept non-closure. So this is a little hard for us because we like solutions and we like to fix things, but this is not something that will be resolved quickly, so we just have to know that it's just the beginning. So let me start by speaking my truth. This is my kindergarten picture from 1969. I grew up in Far Rockaway, Queens, and had what I would consider an idyllic youth. Roller skating up and down the dead end block that I lived on, walking to the beach in the summer, and attending the elementary school where my mom was a teacher. The school at the time was predominantly white with a handful of black students. This is my fourth grade picture. So there are a few more black students but honestly, the school was tracked, and this was the top class, and most of the black students were not in the top class, so it doesn't really give you the full picture, but you get an idea. So soon the city started building low-income housing projects, and gangs became a problem. When I was in the fifth grade, my sister and her friend were mugged in Woolworths, and that's when my parents decided to move to Long Island. It would be over 10 years later in college that I learned the term white flight. My friend teaches at the school now, and this is her class picture from 2016. So uh, when I went to college, I took a US history class, and I loved the professor and decided to take everything he taught. 
He also taught in the Black Studies Department, which meant that I took the history of slavery and Black History I and Black History II. As one of the few white students in black history, I worked up the nerve to ask my professor why, when black people moved into my neighborhood, did the neighborhood change? And why did we have to move? I guess that was my first courageous conversation about race. And I credit my youthful naivete as an 18-year-old white girl asking my black professor this question. But he answered it with grace and with dignity and gave me my own personal history lesson. It helps to know the history of this country in order to understand race. Down the road, I became a high school English teacher in New York City. I was teaching teenagers that often took two subways and a bus, sometimes the bus passing them by because it was already packed and leaving them standing in the rain, while my own teenagers were being picked up for school by their friends and their parents, Mercedes and BMWs. The juxtaposition of images between my home life and school life made it impossible to ignore the disparities that existed. My school and home were only about 30 minutes apart, but they felt like they were worlds away. Over 50% of the students in my school are black, and out of um, almost 70 teachers, only five are black. And this matters. Research shows that if a black child has at least one black teacher along the way, that child is more likely to graduate high school and to enroll in college. Most white children in this country can say that they've had teachers the same race as their own. Not true of black students. And teachers subconsciously have um, this kind of feeling of not the same expectation as they do of white students. And it's not fair, but it does lead to a lot of negative outcomes. So it turns out that the wealthiest black students score about the same on the SAT exams as the poorest white students. And it doesn't stop there. There are only three black CEOs in all of the Fortune 500 companies. This is Malachi. Malachi was one of my favorite students, and he often wrote about his skin being too black and speaking too white, and his friends making fun of him for those things. This is Jason. Jason wrote that the one thing he remembered from his dad teaching him how to drive was what to do when a police officer stopped him. Jason also wrote about holding his breath until he walked through the front door, and then and only then breathing a sigh of relief. This resonated with me because although I'd always known that white people were afraid of black people, I didn't realize that black people were afraid of white people as well. These are two of my favorite students. And I still can't tell you how I'd feel if I saw them on the street and I didn't know them. That's my uncomfortable truth. We've been so socialized to fear young black males. I do know that when I see black teenagers on the street, I remind myself that they could be my students. We can't eliminate our implicit bias, but we can keep it in check. Racism doesn't always show up wearing a white robe and carrying a torch. Recently, I attended a workshop on implicit bias led by Dr. Bryant Marks of Morehouse College. Dr. Marks had us think about what words would come to mind when people from other states thought about New Yorkers. And as you can imagine, the words that came up were things like rude, unfriendly, aggressive, arrogant. Now, there are over 8 million people in New York City, and those words don't fit all of those people, and nor do the people who think of those words know all 8 million people, and yet this is how that group is characterized. That's an example of implicit bias. This word cloud was generated when people were asked what people think of when they think of young black males. Now, imagine you're a young black male, and these words don't fit you lazy, aggressive, criminal. But in every interaction you have with white people, you have to expend energy trying to prove that this isn't you and this isn't what you're about. That's got to be exhausting. We need to develop empathy and we need to pay attention to these things. A participant at Dr. Marx's workshop shared the news that when she got her sonogram back, she found out she was having a boy and she cried but not tears of joy, tears of fear at raising a black son in America. Another participant talked about the fact that when her son wanted a hoodie, she wouldn't buy it for him, again, out of fear. Imagine having to live this way. 
We need to listen to the lived experiences of black people. If we only talk to people who are just like us, we don't learn anything. We need to listen and we need to believe. Recently, there was an article in Newsday that said opioids are a white problem because doctors don't even believe black people when they talk about the pain. The same has been true of black doctors treating, of doctors treating black pregnant and postpartum women. We need to listen and we need to believe. Last summer, I attended a workshop called Beyond Diversity. At the workshop, we were asked to think of some questions that we would answer and then tally up our responses to see how much race impacts us. Our homework that night was to go home and ask somebody of another race the same questions. I sat on the train home and I wrestled with who to ask. I thought of a former student, a former student's parents, a former student teacher, but none of it felt right because it all felt like, hey, you're the token black person I know and I need to ask you a question. I was very uncomfortable. And then I realized if I didn't teach in New York City, I might not have anyone to ask at all. The next day, a black participant came into the workshop and she said when she scrolled through the contacts on her phone, she didn't have any white people. I felt both relieved that I wasn't the only one and horrified that we still lead such segregated lives. It's time to talk about race. Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird says, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. This is often misquoted as walk a mile in his moccasins, but it's no accident that Harper Lee used the word skin. We need to consider things from other people's points of view. So the fourth agreement was expect and accept non-closure, and here we are. So we have no answers, we have no solutions. This is just a beginning. Thank you.